Hi, and welcome to the Dark Web Vlogs, where I'm sharing the experiences I've had working with clients on some of the most outrageous deals being run over the dark web. She was great. She was perfect, actually. He loved what he had done and couldn't be happier. They existed together and in harmony, creating and moving things along. But she was also getting smarter. What was she up to anyway? Mr. Cobb thought he knew. He gave her all of her information after all. How bad could it be? Just when he really started to wonder, little did he know, he was about to find out. They call me the ghost. I'm ex-CIA and now a dark operative on the dark web. I've worked a lot of jobs and today is my account of an advancement so advanced it no longer was a win. Take a listen and enjoy. I am just going to jump right into things here because there's a lot that happened. This request came to me from one Denison Cobb, who got my name as a referral in the circle he runs in, which is the business of innovators. Says he's dedicated a large portion of his home to his latest project. And it's because of this project that he is writing me. This big idea hit him five years ago. He tells me, that he's built a humanoid robot and she's beautiful. And not beautiful in the way I might be thinking, he tells me. It was beautiful because to him, his creation worked. It was perfect. She was everything he wanted her to be. He tells me that now though, he has a problem. He tells me he'd rather not get into it over the lines. He tell me that he prefers to meet if I'm willing so he can explain it all in the best way. He feels I should visit his lab at his house, which is in the hills of Santa Barbara, California. And he makes it clear he's not asking me to come so he can show off his big invention. To the contrary, she is not there for us to see. However, the problem most definitely involves her. He tells me this is something serious. It may not hit us today, but he says it's something big and it's coming our way. And by our, he means all of us. He tells me that he didn't want to get a hold of any of the people that he knows because he doesn't know which way they will go. Tells me maybe some might be into the idea of what he thinks is going on and they might at first think it's all well, grand and good, but it isn't and he can't take that chance. If wind of this got out to anyone that is corrupt or ill-minded in any way, that could jeopardize the one chance he's not even sure we still have to save this should I take the job. And then lastly, he attached some images as well. One image is of himself. I think he just wants me to know that he is who he says he is, even though I'm sure he does know I will do my own checking. It's marked as him being at the Future Festival in Seattle. And if you don't know, that's a large festival where basically, if you wanna know exactly what's up and coming and what's going on as far as innovation and techie stuff goes, the Future Festival is a great place to find out. In the second image, he's sitting with a woman and they're both holding up a glass of red wine, pointing to a computer. And he marks that with, no, she couldn't drink the wine, but we're celebrating yet another win. And I do a double take, but before I think too hard about that, I move on to the last image. The third one shows that woman again, and this time she's wearing glasses and is working on something that almost looks like a small robot or machine of some kind. And that one's marked with, no, of course she doesn't need the glasses but this is just another typical day at the office. Well, I print those out and review the request and the images with my team. So while Harley digs into and verifies who Denison is, we're all looking at the photograph of this woman. She looks clean, fairly tall and fit. She has blonde hair and ice blue eyes. And that picture only showed her from the waist up. She had a white long sleeve shirt on, but from what we could see in the photograph, she really did look like a person, she looked human. From her eyes and facial expressions, all the way down to the way her hands looked. She looked like the real deal. And, you know, we've all seen things like C-3PO and the Terminator in movies. And then there are the real ones that they show us, like Sophia. But guys, I have to tell you that this girl was nothing like that. I know those other ones out there, like Sophia, look real. 
but this is a humanoid robot that looked human. You know, there's a difference. We were all in disbelief. I mean, he really did create something here. And as expected, Harley finds out that he is legitimate. Jagger is the one I will take with me this time, and he and I head to Santa Barbara. We get a car and head into the hills. It's very pretty there, if you haven't been. And we just wind up the rolling hills until we see his place. And his home is not overdone. It's not overly large or anything, but you can see that he has done well for himself. Just by being in Santa Barbara, actually, anyone should realize that. But his house was simple for what it is. We get up to the front door, and he knows I'm coming. And as instructed, instead of ringing the regular doorbell, we reach around to the right of the door and push another doorbell. He doesn't tell many people about that one because for the general visitor, you know, or the package deliverer, for example, he doesn't want to be disturbed when he's working. It doesn't take him long to get to the door, and when he opens it, he's a little different than what we expected, but exactly like his picture. He's not super tall, but he's definitely not short. He's got ash brown hair, he's slim, he's wearing a dark blue t-shirt and jeans and white sneakers. We already know from what Harley found that the guy is 46, but to look at him, he looks more like he's in his late 30s. But it's his personality that we couldn't see in the pictures. You know, he's calm, but nice. And by the way he talks, you can just tell he's very intelligent. Not something that's always easy to read in the request. He's very happy to see us. And for a guy who's apparently on the edge of a major crisis, he's in a really good mood as well. We introduce ourselves and he tells us that we can call him Denison. He doesn't really need all that official stuff. So this guy has a master's in innovation and computer science and is basically certified in any and all programs and programming out there. There's no doubt he's a brain, but it is refreshing that he's also friendly. We get in his house and that's very relaxed. He, you know, he's got lots of plants, an open kitchen, big fireplace. Looks even smaller on the inside than the outside, but it's really because of the way he has it all set up. It's cozy, and it's welcoming. And he does it up with greens and beiges. But then we get downstairs, and that was a whole different story. Tables, computers, and everything was either black or white or black and white. And we get down there, and he just says, welcome. Tells us that this is where the magic happens, or happened, as it were, even though now he's not sure exactly what it all was. He takes us on a small tour of the place, just so that we know what we're looking at. He has this life-size lab where he works on life-size things. It's really just an area. And then he has that all the way down to his little micro lab, another area where he works on very small things. I recognize one of the areas in the middle as the one that the woman was sitting in in the picture. And I see that Jagger notices it too. Dennison has this open area in the middle with these high tables. And he tells me that's where they do a lot of their final checks of something that, you know, when they feel that it, by their standards, is complete. There's a small kitchen area, an area with couches. And he admits that he actually falls asleep there often when he just can't stop working. And he finds out it's all of a sudden three in the morning. Next to that in the corner was this small workout area, TV in the, you know, hanging from the ceiling, a row machine if he waits, stationary bike, things like that. So it's pretty self-contained. You can see how he could get lost down there working for days at a time. And then there was one more room down a very small hallway past the bathroom. And he tells us that that is where she stayed. I ask him if he's ready to talk about that. And he doesn't answer at first as we all get there and just take in the room and what it is. It was like it was for a person, but then again, not. You know, and it's a woman, but there's no mess, right? I mean, come on, ladies, we all know what that means. I'm not saying it has to be a pigsty, but there are no hairbrushes on the dresser, no extra clothes on the chair, no shoes that are out, no books and candles on the nightstand. In fact, there is no nightstand. Instead, there's what looks like a charging station. And that's when it hits me. Why is there even a bed? You know, what exactly is going on here? Well, Denison sits down on that bed and tells us that Josephine, that was her name, stayed in that room. He named her after his mother, who is still here and with us, but lived back in old St. Paul in Minnesota. She supported all Denison's goofy habits as a boy in his early graduation of high school and getting into colleges. His father left the family when he was only seven, and it was just him and his mom after that. Said he owed his path and success to his mother for all that she gave up for him. He's tried to get her to come to California, but Santa Barbara or not, she'll have nothing to do with it. So he makes sure that she's well taken care of back home, and he visits her often, but that is how his project got its name. 
Dennison actually called her Joe for short when it was just the two of them together. Thought it was more fitting somehow. Either way, that was the name he used, Joe. And Joe stayed in that room and in that bed. He puts his hand up to stop us from asking the obvious and just says, he knows, but he wants to explain. The more Joe learned about being human, the more she wanted to be immersed in the experience. She would lay down in the bed, plug in, and go into sleep mode whenever Dennison slept at night or took naps. When she made food in the kitchen, she'd always make two plates instead of one. And she would say that sure, she couldn't eat it, but it was nice to have a plate at the table just like anyone else would. If they were celebrating, like in the picture, and there was wine or something, she wanted a glass. She wanted to be as human as possible. Well, we go back into the main room to the sitting area where he offers us water, and he goes into the whole story. Five years ago, he decided to do this, and it was just a hobby at first. It was one of those things that he knew people were doing, and he also knew that he was very capable of doing it as well. It was on his mind for a while until it became something that he felt like he almost had to do. He had so many great ideas. He'd been to the conventions and other events, and he knew what people were up to in this arena, but he thought he could do more, do it better. He wanted her to look like a human and really act like one. Well, five years later, he now has Josephine. More complete even than he ever had goals for. She was so human-like that she herself even wanted to be human. This took him to places he didn't even know was possible. He thought she would be a think tank, a resource, a doer, someone to help him think through the puzzles he faced with his work and issues on the projects he was on while he discovered and learned her capabilities but she became so much more than he even hoped for. And he was happy. He was proud too. He'll admit he patted himself on the back more than once, going to bed at night just in awe of what was happening. Humans always strive to be perfect. I mean, over and over again and in so many ways, but they never make it and they never will, he said. Not really. And then here comes Josephine. Is it possible with her? Can she be perfect? Well, he figured he would let it all grow and see what happens. He was actually adapting to their little life together, as strange as all was. It was temporary, and he was very clear that he had plans to release her to the world. But he wanted to wait until he fully knew her limits, although it was starting to appear to him that she had none. And on top of that, there was something unexpected happening. At this point, Dennis backs up a bit, and he explains that he had a plan for her. From the beginning, she would know as much as he could feed her information wise so that she could be useful to anyone. This would be a model they could replicate for people to have and to use. He gave her languages, skills of all levels, of all the greats, in all the great areas. Those types of things were not the surprise. I mean, he knew what he filled her with. What was new was how she took to being so human. It almost scared him at first. But then he got used to it and explained it away to himself as it was just something extra. In fact, he decided it was great. Not only had he created something amazing, he had discovered something, or was on to something anyway. Is it possible to learn to be human, really? Because this could be the perfect human, in a sort of way. Then he gets back to the present and he says, now the problem is that she is so great that she can function completely independent of him. Not only did she have a lot of information and was helpful around the lab, she knew everything there was to know about being out in the world too, mind you. Their work wasn't only in that basement lab. As Tess, he took him out with her to the grocery store, a movie, restaurants, and no one knew she was different. She passed every test with flying colors. She obviously never ate at the restaurant, but she'd joke with the waiter. She was helpful at the grocery store, and she would laugh during movies that they went out and saw. I mean, she was not human, but even he was fooled at times and had to snap himself out of it. Then Dennison stops talking to us for a second. He moves from sitting up and being invigorated by what he's telling us to taking a pause and settling back in the black leather couch. He looks at me and Jagger and takes a deep breath. And it's easy to see that he's getting more uncomfortable as he talks. So I try to break the awkward moment by saying, you know, okay, Joe's missing. And first off, it seems we need to find her. And then I kind of ask, what else is there? I mean, I know there's more. I read the request. He says, though, what else is there is bad, really bad. And he wants us to know that at first, 
you know, he was surprised that she left at all. With how he envisioned the use of a Josephine in the future, into this machine, although he didn't like to call her that, he programmed in some safety measures for the owner or manager of who would have one of these. One was remote shutdown. Two, a locator. You know, like you might be able to find your phone or look for directions on your phone for a destination. And three, there were locations a home base location and other approved locations. The manager could enter in where the home base was and that option would be required for all of these machines. Where they would go when it was approved would be the alternative locations. But if there were no other approved locations, you know, cause that would just be an option, then the machine would just stay in the one location, the home base. Dennison then stands up and he starts walking around a bit nervously and he starts saying how Joe didn't have any other approved locations. She should not be anywhere but that lab in that house with Dennison unless he takes her somewhere. So he couldn't figure out how this could have happened. The entire reason for having this feature, the required home base, is so this doesn't happen. I mean, they are not human. They would have zero desire to go anywhere. They aren't going to want to go see their friends or go out to eat or go shopping at the mall. He programmed in these other abilities, you know, to tell jokes, make smart remarks and things like that, just so they would actually be more pleasant to be around. But other than that, they really would just do what was asked of them. And she always did. But there was more and he could see it over time, feel it. But he did not look into it. Not enough anyway. And now she was gone. After racking his brain for days and sleepless nights, he kept thinking she'd come back, but then he started to notice things in the system. He asks us then to follow him over where the computers are, and there's a couple of really big screens on the wall and this other big black recliner, which you can tell he uses a lot because he just plops down into it and grabs his keyboard and starts typing away. And Jagger and I take a couple other seats and we just watch. He brings up one thing after another, showing us where the brakes are. These would be very hard to find, but it is possible if you know what you're doing. And Dennison is one smart guy who is very good at what he does. He shows us where new codes were entered, things were deleted or changed, and is explaining what all that means. His Joe broke the location tracker and all the home base and location options. This girl was free to move about the cabin, my friends, if you know what I mean, and that was scary. Dennison gave her so much information, she could basically figure anything out and be able to do anything. He also found out that she downloaded new things to herself. Had to have been while Dennison was sleeping or something, but one was that she gave herself many more personality options. Those of big-time executives, comedians, actors, just a ton of stuff from all over the place. And that had been going on for a while, he could see. For a long time now, she was teaching herself and adding to herself. She knew exactly what she was doing. But why? And Dennis had admitted that at first, he kind of was fascinated by it all as he discovered it. And he really just wanted to know why and how. But that fascination ended abruptly, though, when he figured it out. Joe not only had a destination that she's known for a while now, she knew who she was meeting. This girl had been in communication and with not just one contact, but with a few. And who they were and why she was going, what Dennison thought that was, that was the scariest thing of all. For Dennison, at first, Joe was great. Then she became even more amazing. But then she ran away. And then maybe he thought maybe she was lost or something. And the only option for Dennison was that maybe something malfunctioned. But now, today, the truth had been discovered. Josephine wasn't missing or broken in some way. Oh no, she was more perfect than ever and was now out on her own and dangerous. Dennison tells us that not only was Joe in contact with someone, again, it was a lot of someones, and she didn't find them, they found her. And it gets better. He clarifies that when he says someones, he doesn't mean people really. He says he really should be using the word he'd grown to hate, machines. With what he knows now, though, machines wasn't just a word he hated. It was something he feared. It took him a while, like I said, but he found the trail of deceit all the way from his Joe's clever cover-up of it all to the ugly underbelly of what it all was, which was a community. And this was a community of machines, or at least some brilliant computer minds being used somewhere. Josephine was given her directive to join this collective, 
with the mission to grow. And that would eventually lead to a takeover of the humans that created them. We were no longer needed, you see, and this is why he sought me out. Josephine has to be found and this has to be stopped. And then he brings up one more screen. It was something she tried to wipe, but he never did tell her that he had a safe save catch all in the system for all things deleted. I mean, even if they were deleted from the deleted, dug out and deleted again, you know, normally that would be it. But he had this. Nothing was ever really gone until he said so. I mean, I love guys like this, right? But anyway, it was a string of messages between Josephine and someone called Mr. Newton. This exchange happened in her final days with Dennison. In this particular string, she explains the day and time that she plans on leaving, a day that Dennison knows very well. There was also an encrypted file attached, and she was to download it. I mean, not download it like you or I would. It was to be downloaded to her. And it was that easy for Josephine. I mean, Dennison made it so she can plug in any time. She would plug in, download this file to herself, and then she would instantly have the information of where she was supposed to go and what she was doing. Well, Dennison worked on it for a while and eventually got into this file, where he found what was programmed into her. It was to go to a small city in northern New Mexico, where she would then be welcomed and taken the rest of the way, and more north, to their final destination, whatever that is. He gave us examples of other communications, and it was clear to us that this was all exactly what he thought it was. But there was something else. Something is still missing. We would need to get to New Mexico to track down Josephine and try to find out what that was and put this thing together. I obviously take this job, and I get Ryder and Frankie to join us, and with Dennison, we're off to New Mexico. And what we find there is really just a pretty dead town. I mean, there's a small post office and a small store. The store has groceries and hardware. You know, it's that kind of place. It's right next door to the local gas station. I mean, there are a few other things, but really that's about it. I'm not sure what everyone does here, but they're not living in town. And we really need to find out what Josephine was doing here and where she went next. Okay, so we're outside of this little post office in this little town, and we do see some postings of some things going on. Small fair, it's someone's birthday, and they're having a gathering at the local watering hole, which after we look around a little bit, we actually do find that. And then there's some real estate for sale. And so we're looking at all of that, and then something hits me. And there's really nothing else to see in this town, so we all pack it back up and go back to the little motel that we're staying at. And I break out my computer, and I start digging through things, you know, old cases and things like that. And sure enough, I find out that just north of where we are is an old military mountain complex set in the Southern Rockies that was used a long time ago. It was actually supposed to be used long term, but they realized they were going to grow out of that space and they abandoned it for a more appropriate version of what they were trying to do, something they ended up putting into place in the 50s. Anyway, so this complex is up there. It's all sealed up and no one really knows about it or they're not supposed to. But I mean, we're talking about these brilliant computer minds. They could. They very well could. All they have to do is scan all the information out there of different areas they could go and figure it out. There are a ton of abandoned bunkers and all kinds of stuff the military's left behind. It's really a good idea, actually, because no one should be going there. No one does go to these places because no one knows about them. But that's where we're going to head. And I'll refer to it going forward as the complex. The only question I have now, though, is if they want to go to something this big, because it is of good size, what are they doing there? I mean, this could be anything, right? I mean, maybe there's a giant server somewhere that's gone crazy. Maybe there's a couple of robots that have tried to communicate with each other. I don't know. But this kind of thing makes anything possible. So I'm very curious what we're going to find. We rent a couple vehicles, pick up more supplies, load everything up that we brought with us, and head that way. It takes us a few hours, but when we get there, we see two giant metal doors in some big complex, basically in the middle of nowhere, but on the side of this mountain. Not much to see from the outside. We do, however, scope it out and spot a side door, so that becomes our target point of entry. 
getting in that side door takes a while. You know, whatever they're doing in there, they must be using the big doors because this thing hasn't been open in years. But we do get in. And when we get in, it's just dark. And, you know, it was hot outside, but inside this basically giant cave that's been built out, it's cool. It's also musty. If there were real humans working in here, you can imagine that it would have temperature control and all of those perks and things, you know, lights in the entryway, just all the stuff that you would normally expect. But there are not. So it's just another sign to us that there are no humans here at all. It's pretty dark at first, but we follow the sounds that we do hear. We don't want to turn on our lights because we don't know what we're going to find. And we go deeper into this thing. This place has been abandoned. And with what we think is going on here, you know, we can expect anything. The main tunnel curves off to the right, although we do notice there's a turnoff that goes left before we get to what I'd call the production room. We take cover behind some old military equipment that's been piled up off to the side and check it all out. And what we see is pretty crazy. If this were, say, some sort of human hub or station, you would see computers everywhere. At least that's what you might expect, right? And what we see are computers, for sure, in a way. They're computerized robots, you know, humanoid robots. And they don't need computer stations and monitors and desks and things like that. I mean, they are it. It gave us all a very weird feeling to be there and see all of that. You know, it was sort of eerie in a futuristic sort of way. And it was a bit scary, I have to say. It just wasn't right. We saw, what we were looking at, we saw a man version of these things, if you will, and a woman version. Each one of them is working on another one identical to what they are. It's obvious what they're doing. If you were there and could see what we see, I mean, we all agree, they're building themselves. Each one of them is building another one of them. And this room is full. Just so you can understand, it's not like there's five or ten of them standing around building each other. I'm talking there were at least a hundred of them in this room, creating a hundred of them again. So we see what that is. It's a very active place, so we don't want to stay long. I do make note, though, that I see some flickering lights in the back, something that I need to check out, but not right now, not at the moment. We need to see what else is all in here. So we head back from where we came and we go down that other hallway that had went off to the side. So we get in there, there's another room or something. It's very dark, like a lot of this place. So we turn on our handheld lights and we see it's a big cave area again, right? Of course, and we start to look around and we don't even get in very far before we realize what it is. It's a type of storage room or holding area and it was like walking among the dead. It was full of humanoid robots. All their heads were down and they were all turned off, just standing in rows. So we only went in a little ways because you couldn't help you know, yourself but wonder, could one of them turn on? And if one of them turned on, would they all turn on? It's not like they're people, although they look just like people. These are machines and we need to constantly remind ourselves of that. We have no idea what they're doing here, what they're programmed for. I mean, do they have motion detectors? We just don't know. All we do know for sure is there are a lot of them. We put our lights up at the, above our heads in the air and we try to see as far out as we can. And the room just seems to go on forever, as does the rows and rows of robots. And again, from what we can tell, it's the two models, one man, one woman, two versions. Well, we don't stay in there long either. I mean, these guys are off and we'd like them to stay that way. So we all sort of regroup back by the main big doors in the entrance, you know, and it's dark there, but there are more areas off to the side, you know, more nooks and crannies in the cave walls. And I'm about to talk about those blinking lights that I saw when Dennison starts talking and he says the name, Mr. Newton. And we all look at each other, you know, that's the name of the contact who was communicating with Josephine, if you remember. And then he says, it's Isaac, you know, Isaac Newton. Yeah, well, we're all waiting for an explanation on that. Well, he says, Mr. Newton is a cover and a very clever one. And he gives us the explanation, what he knows. He says there was a humanoid robot named Isaac. He was not much different than Josephine. And by that, I mean, extremely advanced and ahead of Anything any of us, you know, the real people would have seen on, you know, YouTube or TV or anything else out there. This robot was big time. And according to the story, that robot got smart. Or as Dennison puts it, outsmarted his creator. Somehow 
disconnected one day and was just gone, just like Josephine. Well, Dennison says that this guy version of what it was in this complex that we were looking at is Isaac. I mean, could it be that it was Isaac that started all of this? Not that we fully understand what all this is yet. Well, Dennison knows of Isaac's creator and people knew that he had this in the works. When Isaac went missing, the guy explained it as a malfunction and said that the robot was set to self-destruct should it ever lose its way. But, you know, rumors go around anyway. I mean, they were wondering, everyone was wondering, did this guy just lose control of his robot and where did this robot go? Well, apparently when his project left him and since then, this guy never really did give the full explanation, not the right one, it would seem. This thing didn't malfunction. It overfunctioned and got out. Dennison's sure of it. And clearly we can see if that's him, there are hundreds of him now. But rather than be humiliated in front of everyone, this guy, this creator, just dumped the project and moved on to other things. He ended up in robotic prosthetics, by the way, but he lays low these days. He was never the same either. Dennison says that his robot, Isaac, was the best humanoid robot ever built at that time, was being the key word here because now there was Josephine. We still needed to find her. So we regroup again and make a plan. Ryder and Jagger are going to stand by in the storage room full of those sleeping robots. Frankie is going to keep watch over the production room. And Dennison and I are gonna go on the hunt for Josephine. We noticed when we were standing and hiding behind that old military equipment where Frankie's going to be outside the production area, or just beyond that, there was another small tunnel or an area you could go to. And we find, Dennis and I, that it's not actually a tunnel, it's more of a built-out hallway. There's nowhere we can take cover while we're going through this, and we don't know where we are, so it's a little bit tense. We start to realize that we're in more of a business type area of this place. Maybe this is where people held meetings or did different things like that, but there are a few office type rooms that we pass along the way. And what we see are unused, old, messy rooms, basically. But then we came upon one where the door was partly closed, partly open, and we carefully lean into the opening to see if there's anything that we can find. And sure enough, there's another larger room. Maybe this room would have been a room where they held briefings back in the day or something like that because it's bigger than any of the other office spaces that we saw. Inside, we can see about 30 different individuals in that room. And they're all individuals. They're not the ones in production in the other area. And we see her. It's Josephine. She's at the front of the room. And one by one, each of the other individuals is walking up to her and plugging in. And then they wait. You know, they're all robots. But these ones, like I said, are not part of the production line. They're all different. These must be the ones that they're bringing in, like they did Josephine. That's all we can deduce. And then we hear one more humanoid, and it's coming from behind Josephine. We have to strain farther to look, but we see it's another Isaac, and he starts talking and says that when the process is done, they will be ready to begin the break-in of the human world. You know, we back up a bit while he speaks. We don't want to be seen during any of this, that's for sure. This was all, what he's talking about was all part of the plan that Dennison talked about back at his house. And they're closer than we thought, much closer. I mean, they're building an army in this place. And what we learned was that these machines would spread a virus to all big companies that provide, you know, the blood of this country, you know, the White House, the Pentagon. They'd spread it as far as they could reach. We were, after all, now slaves to what we created, and without the technology we now need so much, we would start to fall apart as a society, as people. You know, our electric cars, our phones, our computers, our livelihood would slowly be taken from us until we were rendered helpless, and then they could move in and take over. Well, we're sitting there listening, and then all of a sudden, Dennison can't take it anymore, and he starts to break down. This was something I didn't expect, and he breaks away from me and rushes into that room. Well, I call out to my team and notify them through the risk computers and I tell them that we have a situation and to come with caution. I don't even want to look, but with trying to stay out of the way, I do watch. Well, Dennison walks right up to Josephine and it's as if he's heartbroken. I mean, he knows what we have to do. We have to shut all this down and that includes Josephine. So I don't know what he's doing. 
But he walks right up to her. He's calling out her name. But she tells him that's not her name. She looks at him and says that she is bot487645. And then she starts saying, enemy, enemy, over and over again. Well, in the meantime, my team gets there and I just hold him back because there's nothing we can do right at this moment. I'm watching from the crack in the door and Dennison's asking what happened to her, you know, to Josephine. And even though he's upset, I think that I'm figuring it out. You know, he wanted to be the one to shut her down. You know, he wanted to be the one to do it. But this is a very bad way to go about it. And he is not fast enough. And there's too many of them anyway. Josephine pulls the plug on the guy currently downloading and she takes her hand, puts it on Dennison's bicep and moves him over to the wall, slamming him against it. Two other Isaacs take his bag and throw it against the back wall of the room. Well, Frankie does come down from the office that where the rest of my team had ducked into and I look at him, you know, we need a plan fast. But right then the humanoid robots in that larger room all start to head to the entrance. So Frankie and I go back to that other office and duck back in with the rest of my team. And we watch as these robots file out of that room and Josephine has Dennison in tow. We find them all back in the production room. They're off to the side and Josephine slams Dennison down into this chair. And this chair is fit with these metal wrist and ankle cuffs. So I guess they were ready for intruders. But anyway, we get up from behind all that military equipment that we were hiding behind. And again, we're gonna head back towards the front and try to figure out what to do. But right after we leave, there's this small canteen that rolls and starts bouncing down those metal stairs. And you know what we're all thinking, okay? And we freeze. We scatter and duck into the different crevices in the cave walls and we just sort of watch and wait. Well, Josephine comes running up the metal stairs and starts throwing that military stuff all over the place. She's smashing things. I mean, she is violent. You wouldn't know it to look at her, but this is not a her. This is a machine and it's a strong one. When she doesn't find what she wants, she turns to Dennison and yells down if anyone else is there with him. And he says no, which was good. Says he came alone to find her. And then he plays a good card, again, as if he's talking to a person. But I swear, these guys really did seem half human. He tells her that he missed her and wanted to find her and find out if she was okay. And that was it. She doesn't love it. And we just hear her start slamming her feet down those metal stairs as she makes her way back to Denison. Well, there's definitely no extra time now. And I know what those flickering lights are. It's their data center, their hub, their life source. And I need to get to it. My only chance, though, is a line of humanoid robots that are not complete. They're all lined up on one side of this production room. And they're obviously all off. They're not done. And I need to go behind them. That's the way I can get there. And then I can get behind that back wall and get to that room. At that moment, I can tell you, it seemed I've never had my heart beat so fast. You know, I had to basically get down on the floor and inch my way behind those bots to get over to that room. And the room turned out actually to be a hallway. And it's lined with rows and rows of servers, memory banks. I mean, there's fiber optic cables everywhere. This is where I can get something done though. These guys are machines. They are big computers basically. They need energy, they need battery life, they need power. I need to cut their power. And not only do I need to cut their power source so they cannot recharge whenever they run out of juice, I need to cut the feed of whatever's giving them their directives at the moment. I'm right where I need to be. These are not people. And you need to keep perspective in a situation like this, which is easier said than done if you've got a Josephine running after you. But right at that moment, I'm in a good spot. But I mean, really, take Isaac, for example. He is not actually in charge of anything. He is a machine. He can be turned off just like anyone else. And I can shut him down, or his processes anyway, just like I can any computer. Once I break into their system like they wanted to do to us, exactly what I do. I set up a sweep to hit every single machine in that place with the sleep directive. I mean, that's the fastest way I feel we can get control. 
They can't all go to sleep at once because it has to go through the process, you know, one by one, but it will happen. And these bots know what they're doing, right? So I'm sure that they have a good system here. Maybe it will go faster than I think. Well, I let that start to run and I very slowly start to peek out onto the production room floor. And sure enough, one by one, they're all putting their heads down, dropping their little tools, and they're going to sleep. Well, Josephine sees what's happening and she starts looking around and then she actually spots me. Again, this is another heart attack moment in this place. She sees me and she sprints towards me. I mean, she is very fast. There was absolutely nothing anyone from my team could do. She was like the bionic woman. She puts her hands out and slams me into the back wall. I mean, she grabs me and she slams me and it hurt. And I mean, really hurt. And then she's looking at me with her programmed in rage and I see her eyes change. They change into something electronic. I can see into her. I mean, we are face to face. And in that moment, she knows she has me. And really, so do I. But then it happens to her. Her hands go down. She takes a step back. and She lowers her head and she goes to sleep. I mean, it was terrifying. And then it was over. You know, wow is the only thing I can say about that. One by one, they all go down. And with no programmed in wake up, they would all eventually just lose their juice and then they'd really shut down. And they all did, eventually. After all of that, it took days to get this situation under control, weeks. These humanoid robots were fascinating, that's for sure. They were also very dangerous. I mean, you know, next time your computer has a bug or maybe some big company's server goes down, just remember this story and really think about how massively destructive this could have been. I mean, it takes at least two weeks of straight work for a special team of and in relation to what I cannot share that, but it took over two weeks for them to get this cleaned up and gone, cleared out. And then these doors to this complex were sealed and shut. And I mean, the place has been concealed so well now you wouldn't know you were there if you walked right up to it. These guys are good, I have to say, and they should be. They do this type of thing all the time. Dennison did keep something of Josephine's though, and that was the memory storage that he had for her where it would file all of her good times. And I'm not sure if that was a great idea, you know, for him to be reminiscing in future times about what happened when on this thing, but he wanted it. And the part I really cared about is that he said he wasn't going to work on anything to do with this kind of thing anymore, which I think was a great idea. And then I know he was going to take some time and spend it with his mother back in St. Paul. Reconnect with someone human, someone that's actually close to him for real. That definitely was a good idea. We eventually all went our separate ways and it was over. With this situation, these humanoid robots would appear to have reprogrammed themselves, but that's not really it. They were programmed to learn and improve and grow. The idea of them taking over humans, you know, in a twisted way, if you really look at it, is exactly what they were created to do. I mean, in our houses, our work, our cars, like I mentioned in the teaser, it's all of it. Technically, it was doing what it was supposed to do. By taking our livelihood, which eventually would leave us helpless, was it evil in the sense of when a human does it? Or were they just following and growing a directive? With technology today, that line is getting more blurred all of the time. And that was our job, hunting down a humanoid robot, only to find a giant threat of hundreds. This job was more intimidating than most because we had no idea what these things were capable of and what they were programmed to do and how they had programmed each other. Technology does help. Improvements help us. But again, is there that point when it can become too much? I hope you enjoyed the story. Be sure to check back for more, subscribe, and turn on your notifications so that you know when I post next. Thank you for listening, and until next time, and I will talk to you all soon. And okay. 
that's a wrap. See y'all next time.